those who are around, those who are traveling, all the members of our family, our relatives, our friends. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for preserving us. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, Lord, for your manner over our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. towards the church that it be renewed. Your grace towards all our family, our relatives. Father, upon our land, let it be renewed. Renew your power towards us, Lord. Renew your favor towards us, Lord. The favor that we do not merit that you have bestowed upon us, my God, as our Father, please renew it. Renew it upon our lives. Renew, renew our destiny, mighty name of Jesus. Renew our work with you. Renew our lives in you. Renew us.
So, Father Lord, we bless you and we thank you for the privilege again. It is a privilege, O oh Lord, to have opportunity to see another day and to begin our week in you, Lord. We commit ourselves into your hands. You said where two or three are in your name, you are right there. As we gather, please be with us, Father. Amen. Glorify your name, Lord. Amen. Every individual that you have intended to use for today, Lord, lay your special hands upon us. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Amen. glorify your name, Father. Amen. And Lord, as many people that you will send your word today, Lord, let your word heal. Let your word set the captives free. Let your word reform. Let your word refrain. Lord, let your word heal. In the name of Jesus, and let your word deliver. Amen. Lord, let your word promote, O oh, Father. Amen. In the name of Jesus, in every aspect that is needed, Lord, let your word chastise. Amen. Let your word review Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Almighty God. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. As we sit there. Sorry, uh, most of these equipment are not working well because all the guys doing it are not around us. Just honey. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, we we'll just um, go straight into the Sunday school this morning. Uh, we apologize for the equipment not working, so I'll try and be loud as as possible. Okay. Okay, let us pray. I feel like God in heaven want to thank you. We worship your name for yet another day. We give you the glory and adoration in the name of Jesus. So I pray that we come to this um, activities into your hands, today's service into your hands, that we will respond to school. Lord, I pray that your spirit will minister to our hearts, so Lord, that we will open our knowledge and understanding, we open our eyes and understanding. Lord, I pray for my family, that you will impact your word into our hearts, so Lord, that we will be doers of the words and not be hearers only in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord God, for in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, um, this morning we'll be talking on lesson 31, which is um, it's more or less like a continuation of the two previous lessons we've um, undergone in the last two Sundays. It's, um, the title is, Here I Am, Use Me, Part 3. So I'm sure we've, we've done part one last two weeks. We, do, we did part two uh, last week. So this will be talking about, we'll be talking about part three of this section of the topic, Here I Am, Use Me. Our memory verse is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 2, sorry, chapter 1, verse 8. And I'll read. <clears throat> Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou particular of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. Um, since the memory verse, um, um, I would want to increase your indulgence that we all recite this together because it's the memory verse. Are we there? Yes. Okay. Um, let us recite together because the memory verse, not our text. One, two, go. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. For be thou particular of the application of his gospel, according to the power of God. Praise the Lord. So our, our Bible passage will be taken from Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 14. Second Timothy chapter two verse one to fourteen. Our text is taken from Second Timothy chapter two verse one to fourteen. And I'll read. And I'll read from there. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness 
as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warrants entangled himself with the affairs of his life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruit. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffered trouble as an evil doer, even unto bonds, for the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for their less sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abided faithful, he cannot deny himself. In verse 14 and the last verse. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about what to no profit, but to, the, but to the subverting of the hearers. Praise the Lord. Um, like I said in our previous lesson, that we learned that um, God is willing to use us and to make us vessels, you know, unto honor. And uh, it depends on how freely disposed we are to God's calling. So we ourselves make ourselves vessels unto His honor because I know that God will not deliberately, according to His mercies, make anybody vessel unto His honor. So He has called everybody with, with a higher calling to be vessel of honor in, in His house, vessel of, vessel of honor in the things of God and in the kingdom of God, you know, to be an instrument that God can use. Uh, because we all understand what vessel is. Vessel is something we use uh, to convey things in the house or in the kingdom or with what the king used, either to drink water or to you know, eat or something. So if the thing is not suitable for the king, there's no way they will serve him in that vessel. You know, so if the thing is um, damaged or is not uh, in proper condition, I'm sure nobody will want to use a broken plate to eat. Or a, a cup of water that is leaking and you know it's going to drip all over your body to drink water and everything. So that's how we are unto God. Some of us have been broken plates. We've been like leaking cups of water. But God is here to turn our lives around, to mend us, so that we can be an instrument He can use in the kingdom. That we can be a vessel of honor that will transform or that will perpetrate God's will and purpose on planet Earth. So, um, but one thing is that having a vessel or being a vessel of honor is not just, you know, um, bread and butter or, you know, bed of roses. We ourselves, we need to have or live a pure and a perfect life before God. We need to live a life that is devoid of any form of distractions as far as worldly or earthly things you know, are concerned. You know, we need, to, we need to live a life that is well-pleasing to God before God can consider us or can use us as a vessel of honor in his house. Now, um, we want to consider the choices of the master and how he treats them. Because we know that from the Bible passage, for, we understand that there are many vessels in the house. Even in our house, we have many vessels. You know, there are some that we keep probably the basement that we don't use anymore because they are not relevant. You know, and there are some that we keep in a fine place because we use them very often and they are very, very relevant in our household. So also, uh, when it comes to the things of God or to the kingdom of God, and we say that the, in as much uh, the way that you have access to choose different resources you want to use, you have many cups. So you can choose any cup you feel like using for this particular time if you are testing. There are many plates in the house. You, you don't use all the plates at the same time. 
So that means you have the choice to choose the kind of plate you want to use. So also God has the choice when it comes to who he will use and how he will go about using us. So uh, we'll divide this topic or this class into two outlines. We have one, the Lord's choice, the Lord chooses whom he will use. And two, the invitation is open to everyone. Now the Lord chooses whom he will use, point one. I would like us to open our Bible to John chapter 15. Verse 16. As our part one said, the Lord chooses whom he will use. John chapter. You have not chosen me. Okay. But I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that you your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Thank you, ma'am. So we saw what Jesus Christ said in the passage that you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. So the choice is of God to make. Um, the fact that probably we come to church this morning is not because you chose to. God chose you to be here. You know, it's not because you felt good this morning and you're like, okay, let me dress up and come to church. So it's my will. But that's not the case. As we read in this Bible, that we have not chosen God, but God chose us and ordained us. When God chooses or makes His own choice of the kind of vessels you know He wants to use. It is pertinent for us to understand that it is not based on popular demand. It is not based on um, democracy that, okay, let's vote. Okay, God, you want to use this person. Hey, everybody, let's vote and decide who God is going to choose. No. God is supreme. He's sovereign. He can use whoever that deems fit, that he deems fit. And when God chooses, it's not... And if I trust you to know that even God's church might surprise you, like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Okay, thank you. Hello? Okay. Even God's church might even surprise you. You say, like, ah, uh, ah. Why now? How come? How come this person or that person? It's because uh, from what we've been exposed or from what we've been made to understand is that everybody wants to go for the best. And the best is not hidden, it's usually popularly known. You know, if you say a very brilliant kid, it's glaring. If, if you say a successful person, you see the, the attributes, you know. So by the time you want to choose something, or you want to appoint something, or somebody into a particular position, you want to choose the best. And if it's okay, let's go for the best person here. Everybody know the best person in the class. So you can say, okay, yeah, I know it's you because you're the best, or you're okay, it's you, you're successful and everything. So that is based on popular demand. But when it comes to God, it doesn't work that way. God's choice has been something that is of importance to him as far as the fulfillment of his will is concerned. God is not moved by qualifications or by your beauty or by your stature or by your educational level. God is moved by how you have made yourself available for him to use and how you are determined to be of good service and will bring his will to pass. We also know that God's will is not by casting lots or by election or anybody goes to the vote or can cast a choice, you know, for the president or house of rep or whoever. And God's choice is not based on nationality, okay, whether you're a Nigerian or a Ghanaian or a Canadian or anything. God uses whom he wants to use. And um, if we look, open our Bible to Second Samuel chapter fifteen, verse six to seven. Absalom behaved in this way towards all Israelites who 
came to the king asking for justice. And so he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. At the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, Let me go to heaven and fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. Thank you so much. So we see that Absalom made himself available to the king because he was purposed in his heart. He said, I want to pay my vow. And a lot of us, and paying vow is part of service, you know, making yourself a vessel unto honor. Because a lot of us make vows to God and we don't even think of redeeming it or, you know, making ourselves available to the things of God. Even though we all know about the popular story of Absalom, you know, the health of it is not really pleasant, but from here we could deduce or we could say that this is a man here that was determined to pay his vow to the king. He even said, Praise, I pray thee, let me. So he was really willing. So God is actually looking for a willing heart, you know, to be a vessel of honor unto him. In Acts chapter 9, verse 10 to 15, you know, talking about God's choosing, you know, whoever he wants to choose, which is not based on nationality or by qualifications or whatsoever. It is based on God's own will and purpose as a deemed fit by whoever he feels will be able to bring, it, bring them to pass. In verse 10, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. To him said, to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, here I am. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go to the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. And he had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him. That he may receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to this to thy saint at Jerusalem. And here he had authority from the chief priests to bind all that called on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and King and the children of Israel. So, like I just said, you know, from the previous example, that God chooses whoever He wants to choose. Even though, in our sight or by our own standard, we feel that the person is not qualified for the position or for the task. Everybody knows that Ananias is more like a chief priest. You know, somebody that is well grounded in things of God. You know, somebody that is well grounded, you know, in the Word of God. And he had a revelation. God spoke to him. Go to a particular street, a particular name, a place called uh, Street, Street, a particular street called uh, Street. There's a man called Saul. And as you want to God, and God, how, how do you want to use this man that has been killing your children, that has been killing the Christians? You know, that in fact, he so was actually on his way to go and get some um, Christians into captivity and all those stuff. And you want to use him. He's not fit. He's not qualified. He's not, he doesn't have the charisma. He doesn't have the will with him. He doesn't have the experience, you know, when it comes to the things of God, or when it comes to spiritual things. How can you want to use him? But God said, no. God said, God told him that I have used him. He is my choice. So, whenever God wants to use anybody, God doesn't want you to think that, oh, that position is for those up there. You know, or you must have been 10 years in the spirit, you know, before I can do this, or before I can do that. Or you must have, you know, gone through a particular college or a particular, you must have one certificate or anything in the Christendom or what. Um, theological school or something. But once you have a willing heart, all what God wants from us is a willing heart. And I tell you that God will, you know, you make you a vessel of honor in his house. Then um, we'll go to the second point, which is uh, the invitation is open to everyone. One thing about God is that God is a just God. He's fair to all. He invites everybody, you know, to come, you know, to his table, to dine with him. You know, he invites everybody to be particular of his blessings. And he will say that, you know, come all, come all. Come one, come all. You know, God said, you know, come, let us reason together. So God is not a God of partiality. That's okay. These are, there are some certain people or there are some certain category of people 
or based on some spiritual level, or those that have been, you know, fasting 40 nights and 40 days and 100 nights and 1,000 nights, all those stuff. No. The invitation is open to all, to every one of us, to be vessel of honor unto God. Like I said at the beginning, that we can either be vessel of honor or vessel of dishonor. God is in the business of making us vessels of honor. But we are, we are the ones that deprive ourselves by making ourselves vessels of, uh, of dishonor unto God because we are not making ourselves available unto God for God to use. And there are, there are stuff in the house of God that um, we, 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 we can do. Because a lot of us, when we, when we hear about, talk, when we talk about the call of God, or stay come and work in the house of God, or whatever, we always think that it's one big position, something like, you know, maybe the pastor, assistant pastor, or one leadership position. No. God can call you to be anything, to do anything whatsoever. And once you are doing it in the house of God, you will receive the same blessing. If you are, if you are doing it with, with a faithful heart, you know, with an open heart, with joy in your heart, committed and dedicated to that same thing, that little thing, you, are, you can receive the same blessing as even the general overseer received his own blessing. So God is not saying, okay, general overseer, they have that kind of blessing, whereas you as an usher, or you that sweep the church, or you that help out with the technical or stuff like that, or you that help out with the children, your own blessing is small. God is not like that. If you are faithful in that little thing, you receive the same blessing with the person that is faithful, that is faithful with even the in that higher position like the general overseer of a church or the pastor or the bishop of any of a church and everything. So we should not deprive ourselves by thinking that you know there are levels of blessings when you do a particular work in the house of God. So that's why we want to be, you know, uh, have to choose the kind of so to speak, don't I want to do this because I feel it's more visible, it's more noticeable. So uh, God, God everybody will see it, therefore God sees it as well. So um, I can receive more blessings and stuff like that. But if I do this, nobody knows, nobody sees me. So how am I going to receive you know, blessing? But working for God or working in the house of God is between you and God. It's not even for the church. It's not for the pastor. You're not doing the church a favor. You're not doing the pastor a favor. You are doing yourself a favor, you know, working in the house of God. So once you have a heart that is open, that is willing, that is dedicated, that is committed, you know, to the service of God, I'm telling you that the same blessing that the general overseer, the bishop, or the head pastor of a church receive, you will probably receive that blessing because God is not a partial God. The same service that God is looking at. Because we even saw in the Bible where uh, somebody, a rich person, can pay one million, and a poor person just pay ten dollars or one dollar, and he will receive more blessing than the person that pays uh, the millions and everything, or even the same uh, blessing. So God is all looking at, or particularly about the magnitude or the the kind of things you do. But it's just little things. As long as your heart is there, you are committed and you are willing, and you are you know dedicated to the work of God, you receive the blessing. That is available as far as God is concerned. So we should not be watching out for pastoral positions or for uh, big positions or something to say that okay, yeah, because I know there are more blessings in that. No, there are nothing like that with God. So like I said, that you know, the invitation is open to all of us to you know do something in the house of God, to do something, to be a vessel of honor, you know, in the house of God. You know, so but the church is now for us to tap into that. Uh, 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 invitation so that if we open our Bible to Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 I read Behold, I stand at the door and knock If any man hear my voice I will open the door Just as not say if some pastors or some elders or if some Christians or if some if some men in the seven churches that the Spirit is being sent to, no, he said, if any man, anybody hear my voice. So he's standing at the door. So what I'm trying to say is that the invitation is for everybody. So it's not for you or for us to be laid back, you know, and not to be involved in the work of God or in the things of God. Um, so um, the thing is that what we need to do is to accept God's invitation, is to accept um, God's call. Because I know God has been speaking to some of us, to a lot of us, you can do this, you can do that in my house, you can make yourself available in, in this place, you can, 
but we have just done deaf ears, you know, to the cause and everything. And we are depriving ourselves of the blessings, you know, that is, you know, agreeable to yielding or to, you know, be, to, obey, to obey the word of God or his commandments, you know, in working for the Lord. So this is, you know, a clarion call for all of us to know that, you know, as a Christian or as a, a member of the church, we need to make ourselves vessels of honor unto God. Because it is our choice to make ourselves vessels of this honor unto God. But that, that's not what God is good at. God is good when he's in the business of making people vessels of honor. Um, I want to liken this invitation to all, you know, to like um, a situation in Nigeria. I'm sure a lot of us will understand what jam is and what um, post you mean. But, you know, they just like the post you issue and um, um, a, lot, a lot of us do not really partake, you know, in the post you exercise. But it's something that I want to really illustrate. Um, the jam, jam is the uh, Joint Admission and Matriculation Board, you know, that organizes uh, University matriculation examination, which you do before you enter the university. You must write jam, anywhere that is a graduate has written jam at one point or the other. So when there is when it's time for to write the exam, so the invitation is for everybody. Just go buy the form, you know, go for the exam, study, read your books. When it's time for the exam, you write. So there are no there are no discriminations, there are no limitations, there are no criteria. Once it's time, just go by the form. So it's not like, okay, you must be this, you must be tall, or you must be short, or you must be fair, or you must be dark, or you must be a Nigerian, or what, anything whatsoever. So when it's time for the exam, the invitation is open for everybody to come and write the exam. So by the time you write the exam, and you pass, because for you to go to university, you have to pass the exam. Then at that point, the university will contact you and schedule you for another level of exam, which is called post UME. So it is that exam that you, you have to equally write that exam as well. You know, so after writing the exam and you pass, then you can now go to the university problem. So what am I trying to, you know, say using this analogy? I'm saying that the invitation is open to all, just like the way jam is, that it's open to everybody to come and write. So by the time for us Christians that we give our life to Christ, you know, we surrender our life to Christ, we become Christians, born again. That's when it's like we pass our jam. You understand? So give your life to Christ because the call is the call is open to everybody. God has sent the message to the world. You know, go and preach the gospel. You know, invite everybody. Yeah, give them the message, minister to them, you know. So giving your life to Christ is likely to passing your jam exam. So by the time you pass your jam exam, so it, the next level is post UMA. Now you are a Christian. Because when you pass jam, you are ready for the university. But you are not yet in the university. But when you give your life to Christ, you are a Christian. You are a born again Christian. So you make you are now available for the work of God. But for you to go to your departments of choice, for you to work in the um, in your career path, what you want for yourself, you have to pass the post I mean, very well, so that if you want to read medicine or law and everything, so that's about last call, you have to pass it very well. But if you don't pass it, then the university can send you to different departments, you know, without your choice. You know, if you want to read law, they can send you to microbiology or chemistry or anything, but at least you're in the university. So that's how it is when it comes to the work of God. We are Christians, we give our life to Christ, we show we pass jam. But the level of our preparation, the level of how we are committed, the level of how we are dedicated, the level of how we make ourselves open to the work of God shows how God will assign us, you know, to different positions in his house. You know. And, and the thing is that once you pass, you know, the postway, it's automatic, you are in the university, so you are in the house of God. It's likely to be in the house of God, be the vessel of honor. So, so that just you know the analogy that uh, we need to understand that we have to put ourselves in a level where God can use us. We have to put in extra effort. You know, we have to make ourselves available. We have to work towards becoming a vessel of the honor by living a pure life and making ourselves available unto God. Because if we don't make ourselves available unto God. God will not be able to use it. That's why I said, draw unto me and I will draw near unto you. 
So if you stay back, lay back, and just allow things to flow, you are depriving yourself of so many blessings and of so many miracles that God can do for you. You know, like I said in my example, the apostolate is an automatic exam that you do. You don't even need to apply for it. The investor just organize it and you write. So also, work in the house of God, as a Christian, you are not a Christian in believe. Your work in the house of God is automatic for you. You have to make yourself available that God can use you. God is calling every one of us today. You know, for what we use, what we answer, we will say, here I am, use me. Or God, you know, we can discuss this later, probably maybe when I'm ready, or when I'm when I sort out these things, or when I'm going to this particular level, or when I've achieved this goal that I'm looking up to, that I'm trying to achieve. You know, but the thing is, it is the same God that is strengthening us, that is making us who we are today. So why can't we make ourselves available for Him to use us and for Him to make us a vessel unto honor? And I pray that God will help us you know, to be committed to have a hopeful heart for us to be a vessel unto honor in His house that will be willing and available for for God's use. In Jesus' name. Amen. Does anybody have any question? I'll comment. Conclusion, I would say, you know, I would like to re-emphasize that passing jam and post UMA is automatic admission for university. You know, and what is same as giving your life to Christ is automatic for being used by God, except you've not given your life to Christ. If you don't want to be used by God, then don't give your life to Christ, if I want to put it that way. But once you've given your life to Christ, it's automatic to be used by God. Then you have to make yourself available. It then you can be committed for the things of God. So that God can use you. And once God uses you, I bet you will never regret your day. You'll be glad and you'll be better off. And you always look back and say, God, thank you for using me. And God will always grow from strength to strength, from glory to glory. Because He is God. In Jesus' name. Let us pray. Our Father God, I want to thank you for your word. I want to give you the glory for another reason. We bless your name, O God, my Father, and I hope for how you have caught her heart. Father, we commit ourselves to the journey of your God. That we surrender all to you, O God. We surrender our dreams, our hopes, our visions. We surrender our situation, our children unto you. And we are saying this morning, right now, that you use us, O God. We want to be vessels of honor unto you. We are making ourselves available for your use right now. Father, we pray that there are spirit and the strength to be dedicated and to be committed to your work and to the things of God, to be happy and to be joyful, joyful in doing the things of God that you give unto us in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for your work. We you give all the glory, of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want us to rise to our feet. I want us to close our eyes and begin to worship the name of the Lord. I want you to bless the name of the Lord. He has brought us together again and unto him we are gathered. Let us worship him. He alone is worthy of our praise. I want you to enter into presence of God this morning with a grateful heart. Worship God from the depths of your heart. Father, we worship you. We bless you for this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for all that you have done. Lord, we appreciate you. I want us to take this song.
that on Friday at the last fellowship, I think the last prayer point we had was that nobody was going to die this year. And nobody would die on family death. I want to thank God that God did not allow the death to use me to give back the name to uh, so our friends. You know, our friend, one of our friends just left for eight So we're supposed to bring their loads to them on Saturday. So myself and the uh, brother Landry, different is that. So we left very early enough. I think we left around the one, I mean, we got after one, the morning of Saturday. The weather was, I mean, smooth. And after Paris, when we started snowing every day, so we dropped our speed. I uh, just walked to the meter after entry on the way to Calgary. I brought my room. So we just, I mean, we were just with us, I think, around 80 kilometers. We just fell out the truck. The truck, that was the last position of the truck. And then we talked about it. I wrote it. Let me show the last one. See where it was uh, this place. I was sitting here at the passenger side. You know? Show the last one. The last one. <laughs> to the glory of God, the two of us came out without a single scratch. Without a single scratch. I mean, that's the problem. I think we can see it. It happened around the. Uh, 
your insurance. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is a lesson to some of us. And you have calmed down. Thank you very much. Praise be to God. Praise God. Well, I just cannot find enough words to describe the God we serve. But I relate as well with you. Oh, sorry. Amen. Amen. It's well with you. Oh, you know, they sound like I'm going to be generic. It's okay. Amen. You will see your great grandchildren. Amen. And even in your old age, you will be strong and healthy. Yeah. Amen. Uh, can we just say, let's sing a song together. We are fearfully made. We are wonderfully made. We belong to God. We resemble Him. name of Christ Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all those that have testified today. We know, Heavenly Father, that every one of us here has testimonies, because there was not just enough time for everyone to testify. Father, Lord, we know you have always blessed us, and you will continue to bless us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you continue to be our God. You continue to bless us in every way. We we'll continue to have testimonies to share in the mighty name of Christ Jesus. Father, Lord, do this and take all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, our Bible reading shall be taken from the book of Acts, chapter 1. Acts, chapter 1, from 27 to 40. Is everyone there? Shout hallelujah if you are there, please. Hallelujah. Act 21, 27 to 40. So I read. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews and from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people the law and this place. And furthermore, he also brought creeps into the temple and has defiled the holy place. Chapter 29. For they had previously seen Prophet Moses, the efficient within him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city were disturbed, and the people ran to, together seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. And immediately the doors were shut. Now, as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in, a, was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centrums and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped with beating Paul. Then the commander came here and took him, and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who was and what he had done. And some, and some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. Chapter 35, uh, verse 35, brother. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. From the multitude of the people, he followed after crying out away with him. 
Then, as Paul was about to be led into, bar into the barrack, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? He replied, Can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some, sometime ago stirred up the rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus, a Cilician, a citizen of no mean city, and I employ you, permit me to speak to people, to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and mentioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in Hebrew language, saying, Can I come? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Because I'm supposed to read from uh, chapter 25 to 3, uh, chapter 20, 22, 1 to 3. So let me quickly finish it. So, brethren and father, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am mean, indeed a Jew, one in Tarsus of Cilicia. But brought up in this city at the feet of Damani, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was serious towards God as you all are today. Here is the word of God. Pray the name of the Lord. So we take the evening during the offering. We don't have a lot of time left to us to use, but it's been a time well used in the presence of God. I believe God has spoken to us in different ways form and shape today. He had encouraged us, he had uh, rebuked us in some way, and he has stirred up faith in our hearts, and to him be all the glory in the name of Jesus. So to the, so the glory stars, we will take the in when we are collecting the offering. Let's start our hands to pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this day. We thank you for the very first Sunday in the month of May. We thank you for your grace that has remained available unto us. We thank you for your compassion upon our life. Lord, we ask that you take all the glory in the name of Jesus. As we spend the next few minutes going through your word, we ask that your spirit will lead us. We have that the spirit will guide us. We have that everything that we shall do will bring you glory in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. Praise, praise, praise the Lord. Amen. I think all that has happened today has uh, been awesome and great. And it goes back to confirm that God is indeed in his house. And you do have an opportunity not to be left behind because things of God are not child play. God is a God that means business. And he deals with people who want to remain steadfast. Because of time, I'm going to try very, very hard to kind of summarize what God has laid on my mind to preach this morning. And actually, Anderson and Eze has helped me a bit to do part of the speaking that God wanted me to pass across. So I'm going to cut a lot of it. And you'll be wondering that why do we have to read that account in the book of Acts? How does that tie into uh, Thanksgiving, because this is supposed to be a Thanksgiving Sunday, but we've got to bear in mind that we are led by the Spirit, and sometimes the Spirit of God asks us to go in different directions. So today, what God has laid on my mind to talk about is what I call the characteristics of a growing Christian. The characteristics of a growing Christian. And we're going to get there, but like I said, because of time, I'm going to cut out of Talk that I put down to discuss. But I suppose the first thing that will go into your mind is that why this? On Thursday, I was going to medicine hat with my director. He's quite new, he came from Ontario, and uh, we had a lot of time in our hands. And he said, Maybe let's talk in any nearby, any nearby hospital. Just take a look. Of course, the kind of ID bags that I have, we open, I'm not making it up. I can open any door. In the whole of Southern Nevada, once I just put my ID card there, I mean, they know me anyways. He's new, he wanted to be known as well. It's okay. I will mention the particular hospital where I was stopped. It's around southeast. And for working, I know the, the facility manager, and I said, okay, is this person around? 
This is she's in a meeting. I said, yeah, we don't have an appointment, but I'd just like to introduce my director to you guys and uh, maybe a quick tour of the facility. We were met with a lady who had worked in that facility for 35 years, so we didn't know what, we had, what was going to come upon us. The plan was just to take him around quickly, because they know me in that facility. Just take him around quickly, box. This lady spent 30 minutes taking us from one unit to another until we said we've had enough. Now, she took us to a place that I know very well, and I've been to that across the South Soul from Medicine Labs to Orient. I've probably the whole of Southern region so well. And most of the health here and here will agree with me that uh, if you go to the Special Development Unit, you'll be challenged. The SDU unit is a place where you find people who are 60 years old but they behave like two years old. They just refuse to grow. The problem of my heart is, but when you see them interacting and relating, you doubt whether they are five years old. These are just people who are not growing. Probably they are growing physically, but their brain refuses to develop. So what you expect a 60 years old to do <clears throat> What you see these people means that they are doing like six days old. I have been there before. I remember the day I met Sister Ngozi from my club when I came around that. I think you were next day you as well. That's the kind of setting I was talking about. But this one took me aback because they have over 50 people, that's over 50 residents. And this hospital was built in 1957. So the guy that was taking us around says, pointed at one of them. He said, from the day they opened this facility, that mission has been there. She's about close to 70. But refuse to grow. She's just there. They are feeding her. She's just like tiny teen, almost 70 years old. So we spent a few minutes there. People were doing all sorts of things to them. So we went around and around and around. And when we left, when we get back into the vehicle, I couldn't talk for the first five minutes because what dropped into my spirit when we left that place is that this is what the life of some Christians are. They just refuse to grow. And when people fail to grow, so many things happen. I like to say because today is Thanksgiving Sunday, it will be extremely impossible for a Christian that refused to grow to give thanks to God. Because a Christian that is not growing will not see the reason to thank God. Somebody turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. The scripture says, In everything, Give thanks to the Lord. So this is not the characteristics, or this is not the behavior of someone who refused to grow. A believer that fails to grow, or a believer that is just a Sunday Sunday believer, will not see the reason to give thanks to God in all situations. The Bible says, in everything, give thanks to God, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ. Why did I say this? I saw those residents, they have about six, eight, nine, ten pots, and they put like two or three of them, like the way you know the way of people rear rabbits and chicken. That's the way they look like. Yeah. And it's even hard for them to say thank you for people feeding them because they are not growing. So one of the characteristics of a believer that is not growing is that a believer that is not growing as a Christian, I'm not talking of physical growth this morning or this afternoon. I'm talking of spiritual growth. I'm talking of a believer that is coming unto maturity, that stays consistent, and that is developing in every aspect of life. They will find it extremely difficult on a Sunday like this or any other day of the week to give thanks to God. Talkless of the men they see around them. So, this is not a behavior that is consistent with a great Christian. A Christian that is growing up day by day, regardless of any situation, she he or she will see God in the midst of what they are going through and they will find a reason to give thanks. At least a living soul is better than a dead soul. When you are still living, things can happen. Again, if you look at Psalm 137 verses 1 to 4, you will discover how... Let's, let's read that verse before I begin. I'm going to just read a couple of many things that I said. Psalm 137 verse 1 to 4. One of the characteristics of a great Christian is that in everything they will be able to give thanks to God. But let's see what happened in Psalm 137, verses 1 to 4. Anyone can read, please? So, by the rivers of the Babylon, 
There we sat down. Yay, we wept. Yay, we remember Zion. Verse 2. We hung our hearts upon the willow and the midst thereof. For there, they that carried us away captive required of us a son, and they that wasted us required of us a man, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And verse 4. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They refused to give thanks to God. What if they've been killed? So one of the features of a believer that refused to go and is staying at one point is just a Sunday, Sunday Christian that they will never learn how to give thanks to God. Indeed, God required us to grow. And one of the consequences of a Christian that refused to grow or that failed to grow or that does not desire growth is that they constitute problems in the church. They become a problem to themselves. They become a problem to other people in the church. And a church that refused to grow is actually a problem. That church will only go thus far. And that is the church where you see all sorts of things. One of the things you see is that there will be strife, there will be envy, there will be ignorance. And some of the Christians that refuse to grow from the day they give their life to Christ become a stumbling block to other Christians. And indeed, we have been encouraged to grow. So what I'm trying to say this afternoon is that after leaving that place, and I look at those things, and I got that inspiration that that is the way life of many Christians have. They just refuse to grow. They are just on the same spot every day, and they can be blown away by every wind of doctrine. Are you a Christian like that this morning? God is challenging you. Like Anderson was saying about the vessels in the house of God. What type of vessel are you? Can God count on you? Can God rely on you? Are you reliable at all? Are you just taking God for granted? Sorry, I'm sounding very, uh, a little bit on the hard side. But I think today is the day that God has decided to tell us the truth in a different way. Right from the person worship to testimony time to everything we have done, God is just out for us today. And the Bible says, if faith comes by hearing and hearing, of the word of God. John said in the book of Revelation that the church that has here, let him hear. So this is not a question of they are talking about me. If they are talking about you, make the change that needs to happen. So God desire that we grow from level A to B. Imagine you have a child that refuses to grow. You'll be dusty for every day. Imagine you have a six year old that is just like a two month old. Where will you be? You'll be concerned, you'll be worried. So God is concerned and God is worried, and God is interested in our growth. So today I want to share a few things with us around what I call the characteristics that are consistent of a growing Christian. Of course, I'm not saying you're not growing. From the book we read this morning, the book of Acts chapter, uh, chapter 21, verses 27 to 40, we find Paul in a situation where his growth in Christ was challenged. We found Paul in a situation where he needed to demonstrate the virtues and the quality of a believer that is growing. I'll tell you one thing, a believer that is not growing, is they just, they are Bible, they bring it to church on Sunday, and they bring it to, to church on Sunday. Not in the course of the week, there is absolutely no connection, no relationship with God. So they are good on Sunday. But after Sunday, nothing to write me about them. A believer that refused to grow is a believer that has no connection with God. They just want to bear the name, I've given my life to Christ. It goes beyond that. Are you a believer that God can look at and say, yes, this is my daughter. Yes, this is my son. I've said that before. Are you a believer that God, when he brings his extra machine into this room this morning, I said, let me extra your heart. Would you like your heart to be seen by everyone. Everyone here this morning that when God brings his extreme machine into this room, by everyone, the public. Go on. And it's the challenge this morning and the need for us to have characteristic and to develop ability that are consistent with Christian living. In that book we read, Paul faced tremendous opposition. He was not welcome. Nobody wanted to see him. And things went from 
uh, initial challenge to the very extreme where you actually beating him literally. But Paul demonstrated some of the characters that I will talk about in the next five minutes. If we look at that verse, uh, let's turn, can you please go back to Act 21 verse 27. If we look at that book very well, the first thing that Paul demonstrated was that he showed law in the face of opposition. One of the characteristics of a growing Christian is that even in the midst of opposition, they still show law. Because God is law. Where are we? I thought we were protecting Acts 21. I can share my slide with you after what David can protect it. So, and when the seven days were almost ended, the Jew which were at Asia, when they saw him, in the temple stared up all the people and laid hand on him. I was going to go to verse 40, but maybe I'll just keep going from here to save our time. When everybody surrounded him, when things were against him, Paul showed love. He did not become, if you know Paul before, and this is the line we need to draw. If you know this man called Saul, up until this time, he was a no-nonsense man. Nobody could stand Paul. Nobody could stop Saul. Let me use Saul. From doing whatever he needed to do. But to show that Paul saw, after his transformation, after his experience with the Lord, he started to grow as a Christian. And one of the hallmarks of growth, which of the fruits of the Spirit, is that he showed love, he did not respond aggressively. The question I asked myself when I was reading through this last night is that if people oppose me or challenge me, how do I respond? Do I respond like an immature Christian or do I just go on and on and try to defend myself? One of the characteristics of someone that is not growing properly, as should they grow, is that they try to fight their own battle. One thing I want you to be doing this afternoon is to begin to extra yourself and begin to ask yourself, how will I respond if I was Paul? If you look at verse 39 of that scripture, Paul also showed humility, which is another hallmark of someone that is growing. They were doing everything and anything that is possible to him, yet he remained humble. I asked myself when I got there yesterday that will I be able to bear it? Will I not just start saying, proving the point? Of course, humility is not stupidity. The fact that you are humble, the fact that you are compliant does not mean that God is not going to fight your battle. But when you begin to become aggressive and do your own thing your own way, then you want to check it. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Another thing I see in verse 27 of that scripture is that growing Christians are not deterred by opposition. He had so many things against him, but he was not allowing himself to be just pushed around. An unstable Christian will run at a little challenge. An unstable Christian or a Christian that is not growing will become so unstable that every little thing, every little challenge, because like all of you in the university here, you will see challenges every day. You will see things that will challenge you. It could be your roommates, it could be people within the campus, it could be situations that present itself. It could even be people at home when you are expecting them to send $6,000 and that doesn't have 1000 naira. You'll be challenged. But how do you respond in a time of challenge? Is your character consistent with the expectation of a believer that is growing? Because the more you grow with the Lord, the more you build the relationship with God, the more the Lord calms you down and enables you to see the bigger picture. Those people that I saw, I won't mention the name of that hospital. They have no clue of life. They have no idea of what is going on. For some reason, their brain just not growing. A 70-year-old woman, and they're still feeding her. Not that she's, she became sick yesterday. She was the first uh, patient in that port when that hospital was built in 1957. And I asked that lady, said, no, this is where she's going to die. She's never been home. And some Christians are just like that. They're just... You want everybody to babysit you? No! God has given you the grace to grow. He said, desire the sincere me so that you can grow thereby. What are you doing with your Christian grace? Are you just sitting on the fence wanting everybody to benefit you? What effort are you actually making to improve your Christian life? How many books have you read in the last one year? Or how many fellowships have you attended? How much is your relationship is like with God? Because it is what your relationship is that will show the fruit that you demonstrate. 
at the end of the day. And those people, what is in their life is what they are demonstrating. There was nothing else to demonstrate other than for people to come around and be feeding them. And one was just, actually all, there was one of them that all she was able to do was just to laugh. And laugh and laugh. I said, nobody will even hire you to be a comedian because your laughter doesn't make sense. Praise the name of the Lord. So, Paul, if you look again at, um, let's look at verse 39. Verse 37 to 39. Paul also turned that situation to an opportunity. A believer that is growing, again, I'm cutting so many things because, oh, time already. A believer that is growing turns negative situation to an opportunity to minister the gospel. Can someone read from verse 37 to 39? So, and as Paul was to the led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak? All along, he never made that request. So, one of the characteristics of a great Christian is that when they go through things, when things are exposed to them, they turn challenges to opportunity. He said, may I speak unto thee? Who said thou can't speak? Of course, they never told him not to speak. But again, as part of humility that we're going to see how this is going to end. We're going to see how this is going to end. He said, may I speak? Are thou not an Egyptian? So, they challenge him that you are not who you claim you are. Which before this they made an uproar. So they were trying to attack him, which is past, which is past life. Again, one of the characteristics of a Christian that is growing is that they are never held to ransom by their past. When you continue to celebrate your past failure, you want to check your Christianity again because when God has forgiven you, He has truly forgiven you. So they were trying to stigmatize Paul. They were trying to make Paul to dwell on the past mistakes, on the things he has done in the past. You know what? When God has forgiven you, you've got to move on. Because if you don't move on, you will form a pity party, an enemy will continue to batter you. And that's why you see people, they give their life to Christ over and over and over again. It is a maturity. And it's a sign that someone is not growing. So they try to hold him ransom. They wouldn't even listen. They call him a murderer. Verse 39. But Paul said, I am a man which I am. Paul was not ashamed. One of the characteristics of people that are growing in faith is that they are never ashamed of who they have in the Lord. Their confidence and their hope is in the Lord. The question for you is that if you are outside of the church, if you are outside of the brethren, other, other friends that you have that are not church going people, are you still a Christian? What do you call you by? What do they address you by? So Paul said, I am a man, which I am, a Jew of Tassel, a city in Sicilia, a citizen of no me. I beseech you, suffer me to speak unto the people. So one of the characteristics of behavior of a growing Christian is that they look at every situation and they turn it to an opportunity to preach the gospel. They don't just chicken out, they don't just back up. It turned that situation to an opportunity to minister the word of God and also refuses to compromise his faith because all along things that were happening around him you had just enough to say okay I don't even know that Jesus even Peter he compromised so the challenge for you and I this morning is that am I really growing? am I only good on Sunday? and I want you to get it right growing as a Christian is not just being busy you cannot equate the fact that I stand in front of you speaking Meaning that I'm growing. It's part of it. But big, it, you cannot equate the father that picked the drum every Sunday, every Thursday, every Friday as growing. It could be activities that are necessary to be done. But what is your relationship with God like? That is the, that is the point this morning. What is your relationship? What is my relationship with God? Am I like those people? Am I truly growing? Have I said bye-bye to those things that I've done in the past? You know what keeps us going as Christians is that our continued relationship with God is a life of fear. Christianity, being born again, being a child of God, is not a contract of 20 years. That's, okay, after 20 years, I'll be free to do what I need to do. No, the only time you'll be free is what you're actually free, except if you're not using your freedom to glorify God. So if God should come around to stay and ask, what is my relationship with you? Don't we really have any relationship? Are you exhibiting characteristics that are consistent or that conforms with a child of God? What are you going to say to God? 
Are you able to trust God that in spite of all that is happening around me, I know God is going to vindicate me? Paul kept on trusting. Paul remained calm. Paul did not let go of his demeanor. He wasn't letting go of his personality. He wasn't losing his mind in spite of all the things that were happening around him. All these things that Paul demonstrated in that phase of scripture we pray, they are the result of the fact that he was growing because if he was to be the soul of the boat, no, they can't do that. It wouldn't even go alone. You probably will have 4,000 soldiers with him. So what has changed? I, I, I'd like you to ask your neighbor, what has changed since you gave your life to Christ? Ask your neighbor. Okay, tell her not to give you the feedback. I think that is one I would want you to meditate upon in the course of this week. What has changed? And I'm asking myself this. In fact, when I left that hospital, what happened to me is that it was like God was saying to me, that is you. So I've been preaching to myself and encouraging myself in my own mind since last Thursday that so I've not been growing. So growing is not just coming to speak nice grammar. What is your relationship with God? Are you just a busy body? We have a classic example, Mary and Martha when Jesus came. Martha was preparing food, of course, and not saying what Martha was doing was wrong because I like to eat my food. But Mary decided to sit at the feet of the Lord to build relationship. What did Jesus say to Martha? He said, Mary has chosen the better thing to do. So being busy sometimes does not, determine, does not mean that you are building a relationship. It's like friends trying to build relationship. And one is just busy traveling around the world telling the other one that, oh, I was in uh, Jamaica yesterday, I was in Poland yesterday, I was in uh, England yesterday. There is no relationship. So Paul, by the grace of God, grew and he continued to grow. Of course, today is not a day for me to start telling you what you need to know or how to grow. You know, and we're all growing. But what I want us to challenge ourselves with as I wrap up today is that what is my relationship with God? How will God rate? If God should come and do five-star rating, how will God rate my relationship with him? Or how will I rate my relationship with God? Am I just busy? Am I really growing? Am I like any of those people? Am I really developing? Am I really growing? Am I growing in grace? Am I waxing strong and stronger and stronger and stronger as a Christian? Or am I just a bench woman? What is your relationship with my God? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this afternoon. Lord, we thank you because you have spoken to us in various ways already. And Lord, here we are, you are challenging us to reveal our relationship with you. Lord, we know you are not how to condemn us, but to encourage us and to challenge us to dig our roots. So Lord, as we proceed in the journey of our Christian race, Lord, the grace to constantly evaluate our journey with you, our relationship with you, Lord, give unto us in the name of Jesus. If there is anyone in the house struggling with a relationship with you, who does not know whether they belong to you or they belong to the world, Lord, we ask today that you help such one in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask that you that help such.